get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Wise here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Einstein Bagels, P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. Rise 25, we hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, probably more than I'm missing. Uh, But if you see the value of immersing yourself with top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get to the next level, go to Rise 25 and contact us to find out when and where our next event is going to be. I am really excited to talk to today's guest, Kaylee Donawald. She's the co-founder of Sacred Serve. If you look on their website, you will immediately get hungry and your mouth will start to water. They're a Chicago-based company innovating ice cream that's fully organic, raw, vegan gelato made from whole coconuts. Kaylee, I love this. All flavors are dairy-free, vegan, and paleo, and strictly free of gluten, dairy, corn, soy, GMOs, stabilizers, fillers, and preservatives. When I read that, Kaylee, it makes me think this is hard to do because all those things hold stuff together and make it so it doesn't go bad, right? So we'll talk about some of that stuff. Um, They're challenging the conventional route of pint-sized packaging with their super unique looking 10-ounce containers. They are 40 locations across Chicago, expanding. Kaylee, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So... I want to talk about your background for a second, but why this ice cream? I mean, I make ice cream in my kitchen, and I didn't think about starting a ice cream or gelato. I don't call it ice cream. Gelato. <laughs> why? What was the first iteration of this? Sure. So it goes back a couple years, and actually, so my business partner, um, him and his wife, lived in Bali in Indonesia for a while. Yeah. And my partner is a raw food chef, raw vegan out there. There's a really big yoga community. Meditation's really big. So naturally, there's this, I want to eat healthy, support my body. So while they were out there, coconuts are everywhere. So he kind of decided, what can I do with this? How can I create a little business that no one else is doing over here? And that's kind of how the ice cream thing came about. And so they had that up and running for a little while. It was very popular over there. I was subsequently living over there around the same time. We didn't know each other, and I had tried the ice cream, loved it. And then um, we all subsequently moved back to Chicago. We got introduced by a mutual friend, Mm. and it kind of felt synchronistic that, all right, I have this sensitivity to dairy. He's got this product that they're no longer running. Why don't we come together and and bring it here and see if we can make it work in in the States? So you both happen to be from Chicago, or you just moved there? We both happen to be from Chicago. Um, They've lived a couple different places. I'm from Chicago originally, and uh, yeah, so this is kind of where we met back up. So tell me about Bali. What was going on at the time? Because I was looking, as I was researching, you're a certified health coach, so you were doing something in the health space in Bali. Right. And and the other question is, why would you ever come back to Chicago? (laughs) That is a great question. I ask myself this all the time. Um, I guess taking it back, I worked in consulting for about five, six years after college and kind of felt like I'm really run down. I'm working 80 hours a week. I feel fatigued. I've always suffered from asthma and allergies, just wasn't really taking care of my body. So I took a couple sabbaticals the first time I went to India. Hmm. Um, The second time I went back to India and on on the end of that trip, I was like, well, why don't I explore a couple other places? So I went down to Bali to kind of continue this yoga and meditation studies that I had been doing. And when I got there, there is this big raw food movement. And I kind of thought, well, I'm into this whole cleansing, mind, body, soul thing. Why don't I just try a raw vegan diet? And so I started eating that way, and within a week and a half, two weeks, I could already tell that my body was healing itself of asthma, like I could breathe for the first Mm. time. I was 25, I had never known what that felt like. So 
that felt very profound to me that okay maybe it's the food like this I'm breathing doing. thing i like this breathe i like yeah. being able to breathe freely yeah honestly it felt like i was getting more oxygen to my brain and just it felt like i had more opportunities and more more things going on so I thought that I'm going to come home, I'm going to dedicate my life to kind of spreading this awareness that the food we eat has such a big impact on how we're feeling. So I quit my job and went back to school uh, to be a health coach. And that's kind of what I did. So I migrated my career into doing that, which allowed me to move back to Bali mm. because I kind of created this location independent business where I could do it all online mm. with cool. the goal of going back there and continuing to study and immerse myself in, yeah. in everything that going on over there yeah I wanted to talk about at some point what you learned working for the organics company but what made you just what were you hoping to get out of a sabbatical I feel like if I was burnt out I don't know if I would have the I don't know the guts to just be like I'm gonna move to India and see what happens yeah. what were you hoping to accomplish I think that I didn't know and India sounded like the the most unique experience that I could have. So I think that I was just looking for a complete change up. I think a, one of my friends who I had lived with a couple years prior called me one day and she was like, I'm doing a round the world trip and I'm going to stop off in India and like live on an ashram and study yoga and meditation. I know that you're big into yoga. Do you want to join? And when she said that, it's a month long program and I just was kind of like, yeah, yeah I'll what be the there. Heck? No question. I'm going to make it happen. So. Yeah, that was the, the impetus in the first trip that I took. What did you Nothing. learn, Kaylee, at the um, organics company that now you take to, to Sacred Surf? What, what kind of things um, were you doing? Yeah, so it I was It seems like you were working a lot there. I was working, I was doing a, a lot of different things, so most of it was sales, so I really kind of formed all these relationships with a lot of these buyers. They sell nationwide, right now we're just in Chicago, but it really helped me understand, okay, what's the process for getting a product on the shelves at a new location and um, you know how does it work that kind of relationship the wholesale side of the business uh, new product development things like that so what does that look like what, what are some things that you saw that you wouldn't have known otherwise um, basically the art of cold calling so I realized you know what buyers are interested in what they care about how to appeal to them what their consumers are looking for um, you know the politics of it there's only a certain amount of shelf space what kind of margin are they looking for in their products how quickly things can move for them what do they want free delivery or do they want sale prices do they like coupons they just all want these free products right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are buyers interested in in the, the ice cream or gelato space well, we would like to think that our buyers are interested in seeing a clean label. I think we're seeing more and more that mm. this simple foods movement is really starting to take hold. And as someone that myself has suffered from food sensitivities and things like that, we're seeing more people that are lactose intolerant, more yeah. people that want transparency to understand who's making these products, where are they sourcing their ingredients, what are the nutrition facts, how many things are in here that I can't read, things like that. Yeah. But you'll have to promise me when you talk to um, Sadie, the the founder of Bread Seriously, you'll you'll update me on what you guys talk about because I think oh, yeah. it will be a really interesting conversation. Um, so then you come back and you meet up with your your co-founder, and yeah. or then you just so then you just were friendly, I guess. So what made you decide to then move forward? Right. With the business? So. We, it just felt kind of synchronistic. Like I had just come back from Bali. I've got this huge mission now where I'm wanting to spread the awareness that what we're eating is really impacting how we're thinking and how we're feeling. And for me, I realized that dairy was a major sensitivity for me. That was kind of my big thing. Yeah. And so when I met them and, and realized like, oh, you guys also lived in Bali. You feel this magical tie to it like I do. And you've got this dairy-free product that you're not even selling anymore. Yeah. Um, I knew that I wanted to kind of have my own thing. The health coaching was kind of pushing me in that direction. But once I heard that, okay, there's this product, we don't have time to run it. You're looking for something to do. This is super in line with what the mission that I'm trying to share. And we just kind of decided, yeah, I think it really makes sense. We feel called to kind of bring this home and see if we can do it here. So then talk about the first uh, batch that you created here in Chicago. Yeah. So we were just, I mean, I think that they had bought 
a little ice cream maker off Amazon or something very, very basic. And we use coconut meat as our base. So we had found a place to get some coconut meat and we mix it up in a blender and we're just kind of running some batches and mm. it, it tasted amazing. So we were like, okay, great. Um, let's start moving forward and see if, if we can keep you fooling did, around. You did a couple like experiment batches because right now, if people check out the website, I mean, you have coconut caramel, right? Matcha mint chip and and the chocolate superfood. And the chocolate superfood, I think, has... Does it have, what's it, turmeric? Or what does it have in it? Uh, that, we've got maca powder in there as well as some shaga mushroom shaga powder. Shaga mushroom powder. That's what it is. The shaga <laughs> mushroom powder. So what made you decide to put shaga mushroom powder in there? I, I was talking to one of the... One of the top experts in mushrooms, it's his friend's dad who actually does it. And he he was telling me all about the medicinal properties of mushrooms. Right. So we're just kind of trying to make these functional foods and give every flavor a little boost um, to kind of support whatever it is that we're looking at so shaga mushrooms you know just a nutrient dense superfood it contains a wide variety of vitamins and minerals um, it's an anti-inflammatory so we've also got the maca powder in there which is an adaptogenic so it helps to balance hormones um, gives a little bit of natural energy so also the cacao powder itself is an antioxidant powerhouse so that'll also give you energy too so talk about the evolution you go from amazon ice cream maker right <laughs> What's next? Right. Uh, the next step was we bought an ice cream, a soft serve machine from China. Hmm. And our original model was that we were going to make these liquid batches and put soft serve ice cream machines in all these restaurants around the city and then supply them with our batches. Sign me up. Didn't yeah, work, though. Yeah, great. Because in Bali, they, had, they were doing some soft serve and, and we just thought that's the way to go. So we get we import this machine, we spend all this money getting it in, we put it into our commissary kitchen, which at the time was just this little health food store, who was nice enough to just let us share some of their kitchen space. And we start running our batches and we're realizing like this is not working, it's freezing because there's no dairy, there's no stabilizers in there. It's just, it was like ice and it just wasn't working. And I think um, it wasn't the machine because it will run dairy ice cream just fine. It just mm. wasn't a good fit for our product. So that was kind of the moment where I realized that we kind of had to give this company a little gas and we had to invest in a better piece of equipment in order to run our product on it. Mm. So what was next? So next was we bought an American made ice cream machine and it was a um, cold batch freezer so we're now making hard ice cream we're not trying to do the soft serve so we just kind of thought okay maybe this product is not meant to be done in soft serve so let's just go ahead and make pints of ice cream and do the hard hard batch there so that um, worked out a lot better for us but that was a huge at the time this was so early that was like a fifteen thousand dollar investment for us to get oh, this really? piece of equipment so you know I went into it being like oh I'll put in five grand and that'll be, you know, like we'll, we'll just see if this goes. And then that day we were like, all right, I think we're gonna have to give it a little bit more. <laughs> Cause that just was what it took. Yeah. So when you get that machine, then what? So we got that machine and in, in the meantime, um, were you experimenting so on the side with flavors? Cause at this point, like, you know, yeah. you still need to, to make kind of the core product, figure out the core recipe. And then you got to, get distribution for it. Right. So we were still, my partners were kind of tinkering around with the recipe, still on that home machine. Um, and then we get this new piece of equipment in. We find um, another one of our friends is a kombucha maker, and he was nice enough to let us share kitchen space with him. So we put our machine in there. We put a blast freezer in there. And that's where we started really experimenting with flavors and uh, different recipes, you know, similar ingredients, but just different variations of it to see what's going to get us the best texture, the best flavor, what's going to run best on this machine, uh, and all those sorts of things. So what was the first flavor? Do you come up with all three at once? We came up with salted caramel first, and actually that was supposed to be our vanilla. In our heads, we're like, okay, like, here's all the ingredients, this is going to be vanilla. And when we ran it, we realized because we use coconut sugar, which is like that dark kind yes. of caramel, yes. um, 
no matter what we do, it ends up tasting like caramel. So we were like, okay, well, I guess our most generic flavor is just going to be salted caramel. We, we really can't even get a vanilla. So that's, that's how that flavor came out. <laughs> yeah, I just made um, like, uh, it's not vegan because there's an egg in it, but um, dairy-free, gluten-free chocolate chip cookies with just raw okay. almond butter um, and the coconut sugar. And it turns it that really dark... So it'd be right. virtually impossible to get a, a, a white vanilla from the coconut right. sugar. Where do right. you get we, the coconut meat from? So we get that from Thailand. So mm. it's all certified organic um, meat that is frozen in Thailand and then shipped overseas. Mm. And so we work with um, a distributor who's out in New York to get it through them um, back into Chicago. Hmm. So that's your first flavor. How much of it do you produce and what do you do with it? Back then, we, wow, well, all these things were working simultaneously. So we were working on packaging at that time. So I guess for the first couple of months, we were just making these flavors and selling them at little markets and kind of giving them to our friends and seeing what people thought and having little socials and parties for people to try it. Um, but then we got our packaging together and we sold it to our first store, which was the same um, person that allowed us to use their kitchen. So it's hmm. called Amish and Healthy Foods here in Chicago. Where is it? The what is it called? Amish and Healthy Foods. Oh, where is um, it? The owner, Lucy, is really great. It's in Westtown in Chicago. Hmm. It's right on Western Avenue. Um, it's a really great local shop. They've got a ton of local um, products. And, yeah, they, they source a lot of things from some farms hmm. around the area. So you get it in there, and then were you trying to get in other places, or were you just wanted to kind of sell what you had at that no, place? We were, we, were, we were trying to get into some other places. We saw people were starting to buy it there, and so immediately it was just kind of I jumped into that sales role again where what buyers do I know in the city? How many stores can I get this into? What can we even produce? How long is this going to last on the shelves? What are people going to think? And I mean – Back then, our recipes were way different than what they are now. And so we were dealing with the fact that it would take a really long time for our ice cream to melt because there's no dairy and there's no gums or anything in there. It was just kind of like very solid. So mm. we went through a handful of iterations there, but um, people kept buying it. I think that the list of ingredients is enough for people to, to to be interested in it and if they had an off experience they're going to keep trying it um and so we're, we're grateful that they did it's tough it's a tough balance because you if it's solid then it obviously will keep longer right but right. then people will have to get like a chisel out when they want to eat it right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what was the next milestone for you so you get it in the store how much of it at the yeah. time could you produce with, with what you had? Well, it was just me, and so nothing was efficient. I was just all day long making these flavors, literally pulling the, I mean, you've seen machines where it just kind of like squeezes the ice cream automatically into all these pints. Like that is not our process at all. We have containers that look like Chinese takeout boxes, kind of like this, and so nothing is going to dollop it right in there. So I'm, I mean, we're pouring it into a bucket. I'm using spoons to kind of like spoon it into each of these things and sealing it like it was a mess. So I'm working all day, every day. Our capacity of production was probably 50 units a day. Mm -hmm. So not a lot. Depending um, on how much sleep you want to get. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, we were navigating that. And then I would say the next big milestone was – moving into our own kitchen space, I think that I realized I was using a lot of time and we had, we're trying to schedule ourselves around the kombucha maker, it's his kitchen, what, what are we doing here? And so we're in a building called The Plant and they've been really welcoming to us and I said the second we started sharing space with this kombucha maker, I talked to the owner of the building and said, look, like, I think this product's going to grow, we would love to have our own space. Um, so let's start talking about that. And so within six months, he kind of said, we have this space. Do you want to take it? And we sat and talked and said, yeah, we think there's enough demand for this. Let's go ahead and invest and build out our hmm. own dedicated facility so we can really start making this more efficient. So then 
you have to put the sales hat on again or what happens? Always. Uh, yeah. So then we moved into the new space. We built it all out to our own specs. We got more equipment. Um, and we brought on our first employee who now does our production. We still only have her. Um, she's amazing. She works a couple days a week. And that allowed me a little bit more time to free up just kind of what I need to be doing, which is, yeah, more sales, more logistics, more strategy, um, start thinking about these bigger things. So that, that was a big, big step for us is when we got to hire Kira is her name. Um, and it's been really great so far. When did the the next flavors come into play? Um, the flavors we launched at the same time, so we were experimenting with a couple, and yeah, so we launched three SKUs at one time. That was kind of something my partner said. You know, we don't we want to put three out at one time. We want to have a shelf space that is three wide and push that out to everyone from the start. So it was. Yeah, it was some tinkering around. I mean, they did have this product in Bali, so there were some ideas already of some flavors and how things go together. So it was more just kind of refining those and, and deciding like, what do we think is going to be marketable for consumers here. Um, we've already got a super unique, clean product. Do we want to start with the turmeric ginger or do we want to go with something a little more approachable that's like a mint chip and a chocolate? So we right. kind of tried to stay a little conservative on those to start. I'm I'm like looking. You see me looking over here. I like want to order it right now, but um, <laughs> I'm serious. Um, so if someone wants to get it, they can go on. I mean, they can get it in Chicago only, right? Right. Um, so luckily, I'm in Chicago. So it looks like I can go to a delivery, which is Mercado Grocery Delivery or Foxtrot Delivery Market. Um, and so, how do you decide what to charge? Yeah, that was. Um we had to take a look at our costs and we had to yeah, be because the more clean the the better ingredients it's costly to make i mean right, exactly. i mean when i went to make those you know paleo gluten free almond butter cookies i mean the raw almond butter is like 15 dollars or something a jar right. and so right. you can't charge pennies for this stuff mm -hmm. yeah and it's tough and you know, we kind of took a look at the market landscape as well as our own costs and we really, we didn't want to budge on the quality and where we're sourcing and being such a small company, um, we don't even have the scale to bring the cost down at this time. So yeah, we, we kind of reverse engineered it. We, we took a look at our costs. We took a look at the margins that each retailer is going to need to make. We took a look at the margin that a distributor would take when they come in. And then we got to our final price and we spot checked it with what's existing on the market. So right now we don't sell a traditional pint, which is 16 ounces. We sell 10 ounces. And we looked at some of the more expensive, high quality ingredient ice cream brands in our area right now. And we basically just matched them on an ounce like on a price per ounce basis, um, which got us to a retail price right now of eight ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna order today, three of them. <laughs> I think Perfect. I have room. Let's talk about the packaging. How yeah, do you decide so on like you, you hold it up again? What the packaging looks like? Yeah. One of these guys. So what's it made uh -huh. of? It's just cardboard. It's cardboard and we did actually work a really long time to try and find something that could be recyclable and we kept hitting these roadblocks. I mean, I was studying Ben and Jerry's and all these thought leaders in the industry to see like what are these people doing and unfortunately because the inside has to be coated in plastic in order for it to not bleed through the paperboard itself, you just can't recycle paperboard and plastic together like mm. that. So. I was researching companies. There's a company that makes an eco coating that is a recyclable yeah. plastic. Oh, really? And because we're so small, they, you know, we had them talk with our packaging manufacturer to see if they can work together and make these sustainable containers for us. But their minimums are like 200,000 units. Right. At the time, we're 500. So right. that is coming. But we uh, knew that we wanted to do something a little bit different. We knew we wanted to do something a little bit smaller, kind of communicating this minimalist feeling and, you know, indulging in moderation. So yeah. we found this manufacturer and it was kind of, you know, at the beginning of the company, you're doing everything. So in my head, I'm like, how do I design this? I'm not a designer. What do I want? Looks um, good. 
yeah, so it was, it's interesting. We, I worked on the logo. It, um, we kind of nailed down what we wanted the logo to look like. This, this simple, it's sacred geometry is what that logo really is. And hmm. so it, it ties in with kind of what we're about. But um, it was in the winter and I was feeling super uninspired. And here I am sitting here trying to come up with this like really creative box for our product. And I knew that I just couldn't do it alone. So I decided I'll take a trip. Traveling for me is always really a time to kind of feel inspired and meet new people. And so I found one of the cheapest tickets I could find, which was um, to Slovenia. And I Slovenia. went there for a month. Yeah. And so I went there for a month and my goal was I'm going to meet some designers. I'm going to just see who I can connect with while I'm here. This is my sole purpose. Um, hopefully I can connect with someone cool. So. I get there, I'm all by myself, I get a little Airbnb for a month, and within two days I meet these two designers, I don't know, I had networked and, and just met random people, and they were super interested, they're street artists there, they're extremely talented, and they've never done a consumer package good before, but, um, you know, we just said, like, let's do something creative, we had some ideas of what we wanted, and I continued to work with them for a month and then I came home and we kept working for a couple more months and eventually got to what is now this box. Why Why the that 10 ounce box? This 10 ounce box is um, a company has already made this shape and so we went back and forth on what we wanted the shape to be and so they were already doing this shaped box and yeah. so it came in 10 ounce size and uh, a 16 I don't think it's six I think it's like a 18 ounce and then a four ounce and so we felt like yeah this 10 is a really good size it's about two and a half three servings in there um let's start it's with one that. serving for me but yeah it's one serving for me but yeah yeah, that yeah. Be um so yeah we just felt like this is a cool shape we think we can make this work um let's give it a try that's great I love this um what do you, how do you break up the roles of the co-founders, the two of you? Yeah, so it's it's kind of morphed over over the past two years. Um, the roles are really that Alex and Anna are the rest of, in charge of recipe development and, and that side of things, and then my role is really more of a business background, driving the logistics and the strategy of our business as well as all the day to day operations. So. Um, you know, they have another company that they're busy with. And so from a time perspective, it's really me on the ground that's got the time for this. And then it's their creativity um, and, yeah, recipe development that, that they're bringing, as well as the experience of, you know, we've been in this organic health food industry for a while. We know the buyers. We know industry standards. We know what the FDA is looking for, all those kinds of things. So, Kelly, what's a typical week look like for you? A typical week is, I'm always down, We call it, the place that we work at is called The Plant. So I'm in our kitchen here Monday through Friday. Um, Kira comes in and does production on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So she's here from about 11 to 5 making ice cream depending on what product we need to be making at that time. Um, and then outside of that, we're it's just me down here in the kitchen and I'm always talking with Anna, our other co-founder. Um, daily working on sales working on you know new flavors new sizes uh, marketing social understanding social media what does that look like we're doing deliveries we're going and doing demos we're talking to buyers we're trying to engage customers we're signing up for events just all sorts of different things so how much sleep do you actually get <laughs> well you know like we're, we're a healthy company so we try and find this balance and so i know that well that's know, i figured my excuse <laughs> kaylee is I eat healthy so that I'm unhealthy on other things. So, like, <laughs> I mean, because it sounds you know, like there's not enough hours in the day, right? I mean, are you sleeping like three time. hours a day? Is it like six? What? What's... No, I am. I am giving myself plenty of sleep. I do. Yeah, okay. I do know that the health of the company is truly the health of the founder, and so. You know, it's just we're trying to leverage as much as we can. We're trying to get. You know, we have volunteers now. It's just such a huge help that Kira comes in and can make all of that to free up a little bit of my time to focus on more of these things. So we have a lot of people that are reaching out, wanting to help with marketing, production, events, and things like that. So we're just trying to bring on as many people as we 
trying to kind of spread all of this around and, and help us grow. What's the biggest thing in in the pipeline for you? Are you looking at, okay, the, the biggest thing is um, obviously getting new locations. Is it seeing what other type of products that you want to produce? How do you divide that, that time? Right. Um, I think that we, we have gone through our head, like, can we make new products? The biggest thing for us right now is really refining our process, getting as efficient as possible, and expanding our reach. So we're coming up with five new SKUs. We're releasing a new flavor as well as um, a four-ounce, really single-serve size container that we're going to be pushing in a lot of our locations. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple hotel chains that are super interested in it that mm. want to do it room service and banquets and things like that. So. I guess right now the biggest thing that we're focusing on, we just signed on with a distributor, is really getting our product um, and the logistics of that moving. Because it is a frozen product, it's extremely hard for us to kind of navigate this world alone. Right now it's me making all the deliveries with coolers in my trunk and that's just not sustainable. So we're looking to these the distribution to really help us get a little bit farther and a little bit more consistent with a lot of these locations. So will you have five additional SKUs in addition to what you already have with the salted right. coconut caramel, the superfood dark chocolate and matcha mint chip? So five more. Yep. So we have one new flavor, which will be one extra SKU in the 10 ounce size. And then we're going to do four ounces of all of the gotcha. four flavors. So total it'll be five more. Yeah. Got it. So you'll have one extra flavor and then just different sizes. Yeah. Which yeah. is a pain in itself because then you need the, all the packaging and then right. what? How does it work now with the actually filling it? Does the does the person who handles logistics do it? So right. So our production manager Kira is doing that. And what we have learned is instead of pouring it into a bucket and scooping it out with a spoon, we're now using pastry bags. So we're pour, we're pulling it out of the machine into pastry bags and. There's some videos on our Instagram where you can see that we can just really easily squeeze it into these containers and then we can fold them up and throw them in the freezer. Yeah. So it's, it's a much better process. Hmm. I have some ideas I want you to do. All I, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so painful to have something that melts. <laughs> I mean. Right. right. Yeah. And not only is it, is it melting, it's like once it melts, then it forms ice crystals and the texture is off. So then you're putting out a bad product. So it's really... Right, like how do you control this environment to make sure that the end consumer is getting the best tasting, best textured product? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the challenges, but talk about the growth. Hotels is an interesting one because I feel right. like what other, other interesting distribution you think will be good for, for Sacred Surf? Because I well, think, yeah. feel like when I get something at a hotel, I'm not like thinking, uh, I'm not comparing costs of things because it's usually expensive anyway. Right. So I'm getting it just because right. I want it. And I'm not looking at, okay, here's Sacred Serve and then here's Briars right next to it that's like $2, right? Yeah. So I feel like that's a really good place to be. What other distribution are they looking at? Yeah, um, we've talked a little bit with some juice bars and things like that. We think the customer is very similar. Totally People similar, yeah. So um, we think it would be really cool to have them either scoop or sell these single serve. A lot of these little health food stores are interested in these four ounce single serve sizes for people that are dining in or grabbing a juice. Yeah. And I think when people are paying $8 for a juice, they're recognizing, okay, I can pay $5 for this ice cream. Um, this is, you know, really high quality stuff. And I understand the ingredients in here yeah. uh, warrant that. Oh, yeah. They'd totally be into it. I just add, uh, I went to a conference in San Diego the other week and I ate a place called Cafe Gratitude and I had okay. this, have you been there before? I don't know if they're all no, across. I, well, I follow them. I've never been, but I just know that they've got great stuff. Um, so I feel like your ice cream would be the base of, or your gelato would be the base of like their milkshakes. I had this amazing milkshake, um, obviously no dairy in it, but places like that would be actually perfect. Yeah. Do yeah. places so like that buy it in bulk or? Yeah. yeah, so it's really easy for us to supply gelato pans. Um, you know, there are a couple of vegan restaurants in the city that we're talking to right now to just offer it as, um, you know, a dessert item on their menu, which I think would be very much in alignment. So we're hmm. working on that. Yeah. So biggest challenges. I mean, there's a lot. Right. What, what's the <laughs> biggest? I mean, I think, would, yeah. you, would you do this again if you knew? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would do it again, but I would have a little bit 
forward. I remember. What I, was into. <laughs> I remember Kelly interviewed this one guy, and he has this big bread company. And I said, "Your stuff goes bad at some point. What do you do with all the stuff that goes bad that doesn't? Sell? Not all of it's going to sell right away." He's yeah. like, "It's. I just thought it was a horrible, horrible thing. <laughs> you know, I'm picturing same yeah. thing. You know, it's tough." Right. What are the what do you find the biggest challenges lately? I guess lately I think, is a better a better better way to frame it because every day is a challenge. Right, every day has challenges. Um, I would say the biggest things for us are logistics. Just getting a frozen product around. Our biggest hope is to go direct to consumer. I really think that that kind of is the future, and we want to connect directly with them and offer that tailored experience that you get from Amazon and all these places now. But for us, the costs of shipping on such a small scale that we're at right now is really hard. You know, you add dry ice in there and then you, right. you put the weight of it on it. It has to be within two days yeah. usually, um, if not overnight. You can't send it on a plane, so we can't even reach California. Um, so, yeah, that is one of our biggest challenges right now is is reaching customers. We have people that are in different states and we just, they're asking for it. We cannot get it to them because we yeah. just don't have the infrastructure in place right now. Yeah. I even think $10 is inexpensive for what you produce. Some people may, I mean, you're comparing it apples and oranges, but I would say anyone should go on sacredserve.com and if you're in Chicago, get it. If you're not, tell someone in Chicago to get it because this is the type of company and product like people should be supporting, in my opinion. And even at $10 price point, these are really really good ingredients and if anyone's made something like this i mean with like you said the packaging and and the sh you know the transportation it's tough you almost need to yeah. sell it in bulk um so hopefully people go out and and get this stuff at um on your site and obviously they can get it in a bunch of grocery stores um it looks like there's a bunch of food smarts um, and then the, the Foxtrot, the market by Foxtrot. Um, so what other challenges do you think, like this is, this is top priority for you over the next six months? Uh, I think really understanding marketing. I think for us, it's, I, I meet a lot of people every day and they're like, oh, I didn't even know that this product exists and mm -hmm. I am dairy free. And so it's always tough to hear that we, we have this product even in the Chicago market. The, the Chicago market's huge and we've only scratched the surface. So before right. we even think about shipping nationally, it's like how do we engage this customer base that is right here? Like we're making it locally. Um, you know, is it Instagram targeted ads? Is it yeah. direct marketing? You know, like email marketing, what is it that's not we don't have that background, so right yeah. now it's kind of us reaching out and, and leveraging some people in our network to try and understand how do we engage this market that we're in. Um, we just don't have that reach yet. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think who I listen to are the influencers, right? Mm -hmm. Health influencers, specifically in Chicago. Maybe it's other founders who have a similar mission. Um, yeah. Like um, I Heart Quinoa founders I talk to. Yeah. They're, I don't know if you know yeah. them. I do, yeah. We um, we've done a bunch of stuff with them. They're great. Yeah. Natalie, who's on their social media, we've we've been working with her a little bit. Yeah. Um, what I want to hear, you know, as you're on this journey, it's like a roller coaster, pretty much, every day. Um, what's some of the best advice you received, and what's some of the worst advice? You don't have to say who gave you the worst advice, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then the worst advice, I mean, maybe it seemed like good advice at the time, and the people are well-intentioned. They're not meaning to give you bad advice, but it just wasn't good. Um, I think some of the best advice we've, we've received is stick with, stick with what you're doing and get really good at one thing. Because when we started this, you know, my partners are very creative and have this big, raw food chef background, and there's a lot of things that we can make. You know, we can make dairy-free coconut yogurt, coconut kefir, coconut jerky, all these products are just at our disposal. We already know how to make them, but that would be spreading ourselves way too thin. So the best advice I think we've gotten is just get super good at one thing and kind mm. of own that and be that, and that's, we've redirected ourselves back mm. to focus on just ice cream right now. Like, let's get really good at that. So before I ask about worst advice, 
what's the most enticing product? Like you're staying focused on, on the gelato, uh, right? But what's been the most enticing? Like, oh, I, this would be great if we just ran with it. What's, yeah, what's second on the list? The second on the list is our coconut meat itself. So that is not a product that I've really seen in the market. And we it's at our fingertips. You know, like we're using it every day to make our ice cream. And so I would love to also sell that product and then supply people with recipes. You know, like here, make our ice cream at home and buy our product to do so. So it feels like this low-hanging fruit. It's also frozen. It's the same distribution channel. Mm. But again, it is... It is a sidestep. It is how do we make the packaging for that? Now we're marketing right. this, now we're supporting that with recipes, and and it's a it's a slightly different thing. And so, it may come in the future, but um, yeah, for now we're. I totally we're see that. Food. Yeah, I totally see that because as you were talking about, it, I'm like, hmm, what could I do with that coconut meat? Because it seems right. like smoothies and everything. And I mean, that's I think in entrepreneurship, that's kind of the tough thing is that there's always attractive and enticing opportunities yeah. left and right whether it's working with someone or a new product to put out there whatever it is and it's it's really tough to kind of hone in on one thing but yeah. um, it makes me think of Kaylee when you say that the Sambazon the acai the frozen uh -huh. stuff yeah. it totally exactly. makes me think of that I'd love to throw the froze because I just bought that the frozen yeah. uh, Sambazon packs with the frozen you know, sacred sort of coconut meat and make some kind of something concoction. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll come yeah. to your location and buy it. Then will you sell it to me? Great. Yes, absolutely. You will. Okay. <laughs> Good. Maybe it's just pickup only. So pick you, don't have, only. Yeah. you don't have it's to drive it. Pick up only scene. Yeah. <laughs> so worst advice. What's been worst? Worst advice you've received? Worst advice. You know... <sighs> I don't even know if there's one thing I can think of. I think a or lot of people... Or maybe biggest mistake. It could be biggest mistake that maybe you reverse time. Um, I would say biggest mistake is bringing people on too early. I think like we were talking about, there's a lot of opportunities all over the place. And, you know, I see the vision of this company and I want it to grow and I believe in it so much. And when people come to us and they want to fulfill a role and they say, hey, I want to help out with this... You don't want to turn them away. They love the mission. Right. But what, but what we've found is like we're so – we're bootstrapping this whole operation. Like we cannot afford to bring someone else on. So even while it might help us for a little bit, it's really just – we can't pay anyone. Like we can't pay for all these side th things even though it sounds like it's helping us to drive forward. It's really just we have to remember that we're so small and we're so new. We have to do everything. We're doing everything ourselves right now. So – yeah, that is the tough thing is to turn opportunities down right now with the understanding that we're just not there yet. Yeah. Um, I always ask this, Kaylee, is at the end, and first of all, everyone should check out sacredserve.com and get some. And um, two things. One, what's been a low moment? And then a flip side, what's been a proud moment so far? All right, let's see. A low moment would be... Besides today, when you have to... <laughs> you have to... I think a low moment is um, financial, financial restrictions. I think that starting a food and beverage business is just extremely capital intensive. You've got to build out these kitchens and all this equipment and all these ingredients up front and all the time and labor involved in making this product that is perishable and keeping it safe and getting it out there. So... You know, you feel that strain every single day. Like, are we going to make enough sales to keep going? Can we keep affording these ingredients? Mm. So, overall, I would say the low moments, the ones that I can really recall the most, are really just being stressed, thinking we're going to run out of money, and yeah. how do we, how do we keep moving forward? Um, I guess the, you know, on the bright side, you you know, if, uh, you can eat the product, so you won't starve, right? Right. So. <laughs> And it's healthy, so like I'll always be a good <laughs> um, What about a proud moment? Um, I would say a proud moment was signing on with our first distributor. I think that that is kind of a, one of the big steps that we've been working toward for a long time, and it kind of just cements that we're still moving forward. Um, 
and this product is going to grow and people are seeing the vision, you know, these big companies, they pick and choose who they want to work with. And so to kind of have the support of someone that's been in the industry for so long saying, yeah, we see this product, we want to help move it, uh, we think it would be a good fit, uh, is a really good feeling. And I think another big proud moment is that we've done a couple vegan specific events and we have lines that are like 50 people deep and we sell out. And for us, that's just the best is it's seeing amazing. customers who are like, yeah, I tried you here. I tried you here. And I, I came today because of you guys and just people waiting in line for 20 minutes in general to get some of our product is just yeah. a crazy, crazy feeling. Yeah. Well, Kaylee, I want to be the first one to say thank you so much. You know, everyone listening to this can say we knew you when and we knew Sacred Serve when. <laughs> um, everyone should check out sacredserve.com. And um, thanks again. Thanks for having me. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.